For the last week and a half, we've been marching on land that has just been liberated from the fascists. Yesterday, our armored vehicles broke into Belgorod. A lot of booty has been taken and many prisoners of war. While on the march, we constantly encounter huge groups of captured Hungarians, Romanians, Italians, and Germans. If only you could see, Shorochka, what a pitiful sight this famous gang of Hitlers has become. They are wearing army boots, some in straw galoshes, summer uniforms, only a few wear greatcoats. And on top of all that, they are wearing the overclothes they've stolen, male or female. On their heads are fore and aft caps, and women's shawls are wrapped around over them. Many of them have frostbite. They are dirty with lice. It gives one a revolting feeling to think that this riffraff had got so far into our country. We've already marched 270 kilometers in the provinces of Voronezh and Kursk. So many villages, towns, factories, and bridges have been destroyed. Civilians are going back home as the Red Army arrives there. They are so happy. End quote. That was taken from a letter home from Red Army soldier Ivan Ivanovich Korolkov, written on 10th February 1943 and quoted in Antony Beaver's book, The Second World War. Welcome to Beyond Barbarossa, the first English-language podcast in the world to focus on the Eastern Front of World War II. Episode 44, Winter 1943, The Return of Mobility. I'm Scott Burry, podcasting from the Red Beard Studio on traditional Anishinaabe Algonquin territory, also called Ottawa, Canada. Before I go on to this episode, please remember that Patreon supporters get early, ad-free access to every regular episode, plus special patron-exclusive bonus episodes. Just visit patreon.com slash beyondbarbarossa and choose the level of support you're comfortable with. The last episode described the almost simultaneous Soviet achievements, the final destruction and capture of Axis forces at Stalingrad, and the relief of Leningrad allowed by pushing the Germans back far enough to allow the Soviets to build a new railway to the city and bring in supplies. This ensured that the winter of 1943 would be much easier for the people of Leningrad than in 1942 when hundreds of thousands starved to death. The victory at Stalingrad had a huge impact in the USSR. It was a major boost in morale at every level of society, from the workers to the political elites, from the Red Army soldier to the highest command in the Kremlin. In Germany, on the other hand, the news of this loss after months of false propaganda came as a shock the Germans realized for the very first time that Wehrmacht was not invincible. Hitler exhibited signs of depression. He didn't even bother holding his once customary evenings of listening to music, inviting people over to his home and listening to German opera and so on. According to historian and author Anthony Tucker Jones, Hitler no longer believed that victory in the East was possible. But he still refused to surrender. He even insisted that the forces in the East go on more attacks. Joseph Goebbels, Nazi propaganda minister, called for total war, which means dedicating every part of the German economy, society, and life to the war. If that's not a sign of panic, I don't know what is. The Battle of Stalingrad definitely was a major turning point in the war in the East. And it happened at, in roughly the same period as other major turning points in Africa and in the Pacific. But the Battle of Stalingrad was unusual, uncharacteristic in one significant way. The war in the Eastern Front up to 
that time had been characterized by swift movement as the panzers swept across immense distances in a very short time. Stalingrad, on the other hand, was a stagnant front for months as the two sides ground against each other in this battle of attrition. Until, of course, November 1942, when the Soviets launched Operation Uranus, that massive two-pronged attack that trapped the German 6th Army in Stalingrad. So now, we're in the winter of 1943, after that surrender, and movement is going to return to the Eastern Front. But before we get into that, it's time for the regular feature, What Else is Happening in the War? Starting with the Pacific, 9th February 1943 was the end of the Battle of Guadalcanal with a a victory by the American forces. On the 21st of February, American forces captured the Russell Islands, part of the Solomon Islands chain. Further west, in Burma, the so-called Chindits, officially the Long Range Penetration Group, comprising units from the British and Indian armies, began an incursion against the Japanese in Burma, cutting a main supply line. Shifting to Europe, on 11th February, Dwight D. Eisenhower was named Chief Commander of the Allied Forces in Europe. On the 22nd, the Germans executed Hans and Sophie Scholl, sibling leaders of the German anti-Nazi White Rose Movement. I encourage you to look them up, the White Rose Movement. Very interesting story that really has not gotten enough attention in the West. On the 28th of February, Norwegian resistors attacked the German heavy water plant at Vermork, Norway, in Operation Gunnerside. They destroyed the entire stock of heavy water, which was critical to Germany's atomic weapons development. In Africa, the Allies, chiefly U.S. and U.K. forces, pushed Rommel's Africa Corps farther north into Tunisia. But then came the Battle of the Kasserine Pass. It was the first major clash of U.S. and German forces in North Africa. Starting on 30th January, Rommel's Africa Corps, with an Italian armored division and two divisions from the German 5th Panzer Army, drove weak and inexperienced American and British battalions back over 80 kilometers, or 50 miles. On the 19th of February, the Africa Corps attacked the passes through the Atlas Mountains, so that's the Kasserine Pass complex. The idea was to cut off the coast road for the Allies and capture American supplies for their own use. After initial success, they found themselves overextended and under heavy fire from British, American, and Free French artillery and had to withdraw. This was pretty much the end of the Africa Corps' adventure in Africa. Now, I've gone into greater detail in describing the Battle of the Kasserine Pass than I usually do in What Else is Happening in the War. And I'm doing that to point out that this was a much smaller operation compared to operations on the Eastern Front going on at the same time. So there were 22,000 men on the Axis side, including German and Italian forces, in the Battle of the Kasserine Pass. And they were going up against 30,000 from the U.S., U.K., and Free France. That's 22,000 versus 30,000. Total casualties, 3,300 from the U.S. killed and wounded, and some 3,000 taken prisoner of war. Some 500 Free French were killed and wounded, and another 3,000 or so British casualties. Compare that to over a million German and Axis killed, wounded, and captured, and a roughly equivalent number of Soviet losses at the Battle of Stalingrad. Okay, maybe it's not fair to compare a single battle in North Africa to the biggest battle in history. So let's compare that Sinovino Offensive described in the previous episode. That's the operation where the Soviets pushed the Germans back from the shore of Lake Ladoga at Schlüsselburg, and that allowed the Soviets to build that rail line to supply Leningrad. This operation involved two full German armies and two Red Armies, plus elements of the Leningrad Front. The Soviets brought not 22,000 men, they brought more than 190,000 troops. And they suffered not 3,000 casualties, but 113,000, including over 40,000 dead and missing. 40,000 dead 
is more than all the American and UK forces involved in that battle in Tunisia. So you can see it's a difference of scale. It's a difference of an order of magnitude. That being dealt with, let's return to our main subject, the Eastern Front in February 1943. So let's take a look at the um, situation for the Germans. February 1943 was the time when movement returned to the Eastern Front. Field Marshal Erich von Manstein was put in command of German Army Group Dawn and then quickly renamed South or re-renamed South. And he wanted to regain the initiative for the Germans. Following their loss in Stalingrad, the, the German Army Group withdrew west uh, of the Don River, but that left the 17th Army trapped south of the Soviet armies, 300 kilometers or 200 miles from the rest. They were east of the Sea of Azov, but north of the Caucasus Mountains. So if you take a look at the maps on the website, you'll see exactly what I mean. The 17th Army managed to get to the Taman Peninsula, that part of land that reaches toward the Kerch Peninsula on the Crimea. Yes, you're right. That's exactly where Russia's Kerch Bridge is or was and is now pretty much out of commission due to Ukrainian drone attacks in 2024. You can see it in map one on the webpage for this episode. Just go to beyondbarbarossa.ca and select this episode and that will open it up. Remember to click on the title rather than the picture. If you click on the picture, it'll start playing in your web browser. Uh, if you click on the title, the words themselves that will take you to a page for this episode with all those resources, maps, pictures, and so on. Now, this um, situation where the Germans were holed up, the 17th Army, was called the Kuban Bridgehead. So they built a defensive position across the uh, Kuban River Delta, five defensive lines and trenches, and they managed to hold on there for several months under constant fire from the Red Army. By this point, that is February 1943, the Germans have fewer than 500 tanks left on the entire Eastern Front. Most of them are the Panzer III's and IV's, older designs, and no match for the Soviet T-34's. Although, I know people have posted on the internet that Panzer IV's did knock out a number of Soviet T-34's, but there was an older design, didn't have the army and armor, and didn't have the, usually didn't have the kind of gun that was necessary to penetrate the armor of the T-34. Now, the Germans did have some of those Tiger tanks, the much feared new models. Their 88 millimeter guns could punch through the armor of a T-34. And also, they fired accurately at up to 1,100 meters or 1,200 yards away. However, their first deployment at Leningrad a month earlier, as described last episode, had kind of been disappointing. They just hadn't lived up to their hype. In addition, the Tigers were complex to build, expensive to manufacture, and they, at this point, didn't have all the bugs worked out yet. So if one was destroyed, and several were on the Eastern Front, it was hard and a long process to replace it. In comparison to that the total complement of 500 tanks across the entire Eastern Front, the Soviets had 10,000 tanks and self-propelled guns, and their factories were churning out 2,000 new ones every month. Germany just could not keep up. So with all this presumably in mind, Stalin, of course, the dictator of the USSR, wanted to capitalize on the victory at Stalingrad, continue pushing hard and fast to drive the Germans out of Soviet territory. Even before the final surrender at Stalingrad, on 29th January, General Nikolai Vatutin's southwestern front, comprising the Red Sixth Army and the First Guards Army, attacked southwest toward Luhansk and Donetsk, cities well known in the news today. Their ultimate goal was to reach Mariupol on the Sea of Azov. This operation brought 325,000 men and 362 tanks against the Germans' 160,000 men and 160 tanks. 
See what I mean by dwarfing the operations in North Africa? Operation Gallup's initial success made it look like the Red Armies would trap the 1st and 4th Panzer Armies, as well as Army Group Hollett, against the Azov Sea. But von Manstein finally got Hitler to agree to a withdrawal, and they moved west of the Meuse River, out of danger for the time being. Now, almost simultaneously with Operation Gallup, the Red Army launched another operation a bit farther north. We'll get into that, but first, let's take a short break. Remember, you can support this podcast in multiple ways. Make a monthly or a one-time donation through Patreon. That's patreon.com slash beyondbarbarossa. Through reviews on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you follow this podcast on. And by telling your friends who are into history, beyondbarbarossa.ca. This episode is brought to you by the Eastern Front Trilogy, the true story of a Canadian, Maurice Burry, drafted into the Soviet Red Army in 1941, just in time to be thrown between the jaws of the USSR and Nazi Germany at the launch of the greatest land invasion in history, Operation Barbarossa. In three volumes, Army of Worn Souls, Under the Nazi Heel, and Walking Out of War. The Eastern Front Trilogy is the story of the largest and deadliest side of the Second World War, seen through the eyes of a man who was there from the earliest days in 1941, through Germany's grinding occupation of Ukraine, and finally to the savage end of the war in Berlin. You can find the three individual volumes as ebooks exclusively on Amazon, or purchase a three-volume complete paperback on any online book retailer or at your local bookstore. To learn more about the Eastern Front Trilogy, visit scottburyauthor.com. Did you know that the cappuccino was invented by a Ukrainian? Or that many first names, like Philip and Agatha, were brought to Western Europe by Ukrainian princesses? Or that a Ukrainian was the first female given the rank of officer in a modern army. Well, if you didn't, and even if you did, you can learn more about my podcast, Wandering the Edge, a podcast about Ukrainian history with a spot of travel. And if you like Beyond Barbarossa as much as I do, because, well, it makes my life a whole lot easier since I don't have to do any episodes deep diving into the Eastern Front of the Second World War, please take a listen to Wandering the Edge for a deep dive into Ukrainian history, culture, and traditions. Find out more on wanderingtheedge.net. And now let's get back to Scott exploring and explaining the Eastern Front of the Second World War. Thanks for coming back. We were talking about Operation Gallup, where the Red Army was trying to trap the 1st and 4th Panzer Armies on the uh, Azov Sea and destroy them capturing Mariupol. Now, while Gallup was galloping forward on 1st February, so just two days after the launch of that operation, the Red Army launched Operation Zvezda, or STAR. Its goal to take advantage of the 300 kilometer or 200 mile gap between the German Army Group South and Army Group Center. The 13th and 38th Armies of the Voronezh Front commanded by General Philip Golikov, thrust southwest toward Kursk, while the 60th, 40th, and 3rd tank armies, so in total less five full armies, they advanced toward Kharkiv. See map 2 on the website. By the 5th of February, so three days after the final surrender at Stalingrad, the 3rd tank army liberated the cities of Volchansk, Belgorod, Oboyan, and Kursk, and reached the Donets River, heart of the Donbass, or Don Basin. The next target, Kharkiv, called Kharkov in Russian. Hitler ordered the SS Panzer Corps to, quote, stand firm, end quote. But its commander, General Paul Hauser, realized he could be surrounded and feared that Kharkiv would become another Stalingrad. So he pulled back west on the 15th of February. The 1st Guards Army and the 6th Army from the Southwestern Front were now pushing to, from Kharkiv toward the city of Dnipro, then called by the Russians Dnipropovetsk, situated on, you guessed it, the Dnipro River, 
where it makes a bend to the south. It's kind of its farthest reach eastward. As you can see in map 3, that created a salient, something sure to tempt the Germans. And it did. On 19th February, von Manstein ordered a two-pronged counterattack. The SS Panzer Corps struck south from Krasnograd toward Pavlograd. See the map. Hermann Hott's 4th Panzer Army linked up with them three days later. And from the south, the 40th Panzer Corps of the 1st Panzer Army joined in and defeated the Red Army in a battle near Krasnomaresk. The Germans pushed 150 miles, over 200 kilometers east, almost all the way to Kharkiv again. The Red 3rd Tank Army hit the SS Panzer Corps in the north of the salient on 24th February. The Germans pulled back and the Soviets advanced. But it was a trap. And they lost 61 tanks, 60 other vehicles, and 9,000 men. What remained of the 3rd Tank Army withdrew another 40 miles back to the Donuts River. This fighting to the end of February stopped the Soviets' advances which had been pretty much constant for three months since the launch of Operation Uranus. Soviet losses over this period were 676 tanks, 579 artillery pieces, at least 10,000 captured, and 32,000 dead. Despite Ivan Ivanovich's assessment of the pitiful Axis prisoners, as I read to you at the beginning of this episode, the Germans were still a formidable enemy in the winter of 1943. Von Manstein's army group south included the 1st Panzer Army and the 4th Panzer Army, and these included the 40th Panzer Corps, the SS Panzer Corps, and the 4th Panzer Army including the 48th Panzer Corps and the SS Panzer Corps. In total, around 160,000 men. Every division was under strength because on paper they were supposed to have about 210,000. Up against the 210,000 Red Army soldiers that they faced across the lines. The Panzer divisions had, on paper, 100 tanks each, but only were able to field 70, maybe 80 at any one time because not all of them were serviceable at all at the same time. Most of them were the older Panzer threes and fours. Now, the Germans also had another asset, a very great one, the 4th and 6th Luftflotte, or air fleets, of Wolfram von Richthofen. These comprised 1,214 aircraft, which flew more than 1,000 missions per day between the 20th of February and the 15th of March in this area alone. On 19th February, south of that great penetration toward the Dnipro, Army Group South launched a new initiative, smashing through the Voronezh Front. The 1st SS Division Liebstandard SS Adolf Hitler cut through the Red 6th Army, surrounding and destroying several units. Meanwhile, the Das Reich Division and the Totenkopf, or Death's Head Division, advanced northeast, cutting off the Soviet supply lines. On the 25th of February, the Soviet Dawn Front, now renamed the Central Front, commanded by our old friend Konstantin Rokossovsky, launched another offensive to blunt this German surge. This involved the 21st, 65th, and 70th Armies and the 2nd Tank Army. The last of those liberated the town of Sevsk in the Bryansk Oblast in two weeks. That means they moved about 120 kilometers, or 80 miles, west of Kursk. That's what I mean by the movement in this phase of the war in the east. Meanwhile, a unit of the 2nd Guards Cavalry Corps reached even farther west to the town of Novorodzvetsky. But all these operations, all this movement, cost heavily. The swift movements over the great extensive territories meant the Soviet supply lines were overextended. Army Group South was able to encircle large numbers of Red Army units in the southern part of the salient. The Germans managed to advance 80 kilometers, or 50 miles. By 6th March, they were back to within 10 miles, 16 kilometers, south of Kharkiv. Rokossovsky's counter-offensive had to stop. 
So on March 6th, von Manstein was able to begin phase two of his next move, capturing Kharkiv for the second time. And we'll dive into that in the next episode. What struck me in researching and writing the details of this episode was the swift and extensive movement. Both sides, the Germans and the Soviets, traveled great distances back and forth, advancing 50, 80, 100 kilometers one way and pulling back as far the other way. From the end of the Battle of Stalingrad, that is the beginning of February, to the middle of March, The Red Armies advanced over 400 kilometers, or 250 miles in certain places. Then they retreated again more than 100 kilometers. They recaptured Kharkiv, but at this point they're faced with losing it again. What this shows in sum is that by the middle of the winter of 1943, the initiative in this war in the East was solidly in the USSR's hands. Their forces were huge, with thousands of tanks and hundreds of thousands of men. But while the Germans have been mauled and weakened, they're still able to mount stunning attacks of their own. As in 1941, they're still encircling and capturing large numbers of Red Army soldiers, just not quite on the same scale. They're not capturing millions of men, but thousands. As Anthony Tucker Jones says, quote, Germany is down but not out, end quote. We'll see just how much juice they have left in the tank next episode, when we look at the Third Battle of Kharkiv, and also take a look farther north on the Eastern Front, where Finland has been active. It's time we took a closer look at the Northern War. Thank you for listening to Beyond Barbarossa, the podcast about the Eastern Front of the Second World War. For a better understanding of the progress of the war, you can always see the maps and the photos on the website beyondbarbarossa.ca or beyondbarbarossa.podbean.com. You can also listen to the episode, if you like, on my own website, writtenword.ca, and just click on the podcast button in the banner at the top. I want to take this opportunity to thank Philip Ostrand, Elliot Goldman, Dirk Jan Muntendam, Gavin Edwards, William L. Hall, and Nicholas Thomas, who recently have become regular supporters through Patreon. And I want to thank all who have supported the podcast up to this date through Patreon. Patrons at any level get early access to episodes as well as bonus episodes every couple of months. To become a supporter, all you have to do is go to patreon.com slash beyondbarbarossa and choose a level of support you're comfortable with. If you like this episode or the show in general, please consider following Beyond Barbarossa on your preferred podcasting app. And I would really love a rating on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Podbean, or wherever you listen. And I'm not asking you just to leave a five-star review. Tell me what you really think. Any review, any rating at all helps spread the word to others who are interested in history. If you have any questions or thoughts or comments to make, or, God forbid, you find I've made any errors, please reach out. You can send me an email to contact at beyondbarbarossa.ca, or you can reach me through the Facebook Beyond Barbarossa page. Original music was composed and recorded by Nicholas Burry. I'm Scott Burry. Until next episode, keep your paddles in the water. Slava Ukraina.